I'm gonna, I, I could honestly talk to you guys all day, but I'm gonna have to wrap this up at some point. I do want to ask David uh, one last question about. I, I find that the the, the whole um, uh, the economics of, of of games like this fascinating. Not the Kickstarter, the real world side, but uh, the actual in game economies. I know with, mm -hmm. obviously with Elite, the idea of an a, 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 an economy, and you started with a hundred credits, and you were trying to build that up and buying and trading. Uh, goods to, to, to get better ships and, and better equipment was always a big part of the original elite. But I imagine it was fairly straightforward to create kind of a lockdown economy the way that you coded it. Once you create an online um, world where you populate the real players, you really do create kind of a, a, a real virtual free market with all the chaos and unpredictability that entails. I, I think I read recently that Blizzard recently had to hire an actual real economist to work with them to, to keep their kind of Warcraft economy uh, afloat for the for the fear of you know possible real you know actual kind of virtual stock market crash is going to occur. So how do you? I mean, I mean that's that's a science unto itself, and it, it seems to me like a very scary area of a game like this. How do you even begin to approach something like that? <laughs> well, um, yes, I think the idea is um, you've got to make the, them quite robust in the first place. Uh, you know the the um, the way the economies work. You know we, that's something we, which we're already looking at. You know in terms of how if you buy loads of food, the price therefore goes up. So you get lots of players gaming the system. You get lots of players all coming in, holding back their cargoes and then dumping them all very quickly. Uh, and then the, the people will hold back so that they're the last one to do it so that they get, um, you know, for whatever reason, or, or you know, they, they all want to be the first to get the high price, if you like. But actually, from a game point of view, I think that's really interesting. You know, I, I know with um, the whole the, the, um, Warcraft discussion about hiring economists, but you do wonder what the agenda is. Actually, part of the fun is going to be bringing down the economists. What we're, we're not talking about here is having one great big economy that can be brought down. What we're expecting is a, lots of smaller economies or linked economies that you can bring down. And actually, part of the gameplay delay will be trying to bring them down because that will trigger game behaviours that is actually what the players are after and brings interest to the galaxy. So we've got a slightly, we're not, we're not like um, the, the finance people in the real world who are trying to prevent it happening. We're trying to make sure that it's interesting when bad things go wrong, you know, when it does reach extremes, uh, when, um, when there are food shortages or massive over um, stocks of food where people, from a, game, from a player point of view, that's then a big opportunity. You start buying the food because the price is rock bottom. Chris, do you have a similar approach to what's your approach to, to the in-game economy of uh, something like Star Citizen? Well, I, mean, I think it's I think it's pretty similar to uh, to David's. I mean, I think David's. I mean, the other thing you got to remember is the style of game that Elite is, and the style of game that sort of Freelancer and Privateer is, and Star Citizen uh, is going to be is very much sort of centered on sort of economies and trading, and and that's actually a part of the gameplay. So a lot of these other games that have it, with maybe the exception of like Eve Online. Um, you know, they're trying to like, they're trying to sort of back, uh, you know, backfill in sort of yeah. some of this economy stuff. And I think that's why they have problems. So like the way I, the way my attitude and approach, which I think the attitude that David's taking too, is that, you know, I kind of want to approach, I want to simulate it like, like you would in the real world. So, I mean, it's, and it, and it should be, by the way, not just some assets or facets of it. So, you know, like in the Star Citizen world, we not only have all the trading and sort of the supply and demand and, you know, too much stuff will drive down prices but we've also got the flip side of it which is sort of you know the cost of doing business right so we have a lot of things in the game like landing tariffs or trade taxes or uh, ship insurance and stuff like that because in the real world you know in an economy there are sort of there are sort of money drains as well as you know because otherwise you can have this in inflation like we all have we all have to pay rent or we have to pay our mortgage or we have to pay you know our car insurance or we you know have to pay for our fuel and all that sort of stuff and so and the reason we go out and we earn a, a salary is so we can afford to do all that, and then maybe we got some money left over so we can take a nice little vacation and do something like that. And, and and so from 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 that standpoint, I think the more of that you simulate, the better. And it also allows you to do some interesting things, which I'm kind of looking forward to do. Is like one of the ways that governments control that population is by by basically tax code, right? So you sort of incentivize people to have more kids or have less kids or whatever via the different breaks you get in the tech systems. And the same again, you know, one of the problems you have in MMOs is like, how do I stop everybody coming to one location? Well, you know, one way is obviously 
you make it not particularly profitable to trade there. So one way is the prices are going to crash if too many people come and are selling iron ore in an industrial planet, something like that. But another way would be, you no, know, okay, well, we're in this part of the galaxy and there's a lot of law and order and, and so you've got to pay for it. So you have higher landing fees and you have trade tariffs. And if I increase those, then it will be less profitable for people to uh, trade there and then maybe go to other areas of the galaxy. So kind of the way we're approaching it is very much like the real world where, you know, there are, if you're in areas that are, you know, nice and safe and, uh, you know, a lot of law and order like the U.S., well, you know, you kind of pay for that because you have other costs are associated with being in a safe area. But if you want to, like, not pay anything and have the greatest amount of uh, uh, sort of reward, um, you can go to the outer edge of the galaxy and there are no landing tariffs and there are no, um, you know, trade taxes, but also there's no law and order. So you're going to be quite open to getting attacked by a pirate. And I think the more, if you try it, the more elements of a real economy you put in, and this is my theory, so I, I could implode terribly, but I, I don't necessarily uh, think it will. Uh, I think the more that sort of uh, setup will, na the players themselves will naturally find a balance. And as you know, David said, it's fine if like one planet or area has its own like stock market crash. I mean, that's what you want to have happen. You want to have, you want to have a whole universe that kind of does this. And so as, as long as you have something that, 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 you know, you don't have inflation that goes out of control in your overall universe, um, it should be pretty cool. And you'll actually see, uh, and it'll be cool to see the players sort of affecting it. And you'll, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure David's going to build it. We're going to build it. You know, we'll have our sort of control center where we can sort of look at the galaxy as a whole and see where people are flying and see what they're trading and kind of what the prices are. And I think it'll be a really interesting uh, sort of experiment to sort of see kind of how that changes over time. And if you if you put something in one area, does it affect uh, the rest of the galaxy? You know, that sort of butterfly flaps its wings on uh, you know in China yeah. kind of thing. So, but I think there's a, there's a fundamental question behind what you're asking as well, Gary, which is that. Um, which is also what we're looking at, is that the rate of earning money via different routes. So if you're um, behaving as a pirate, if you're behaving as an assassin, as a miner, you know, what is your expected gain over a period of time? Because what we don't want is any one approach to be vastly greater financially than another, because otherwise all the players then feel they'll have to do that. You know, and I think that's a real shame. I want you to be able to be have life as a trader as a bounty hunter um as, as all the various sort of even asteroid mining you know that where you then guard your precious discoveries you know where a lot of that is exploration each of those ideally have a similar average revenue rate per game time i mean what people tend to do in a lot of things both in real life and in games is uh, you imagine a graph and it's what's called an exponential where you're always increasing the amount of money you have by a fixed percentage per, per hour, per day or whatever. And so we have to make sure that each of the professions fit on that curve very well and don't unbalance the game. And I think that's the other side to the economy thing, that actually stock market crashes are fine. The, the danger is if there is an exploit where you can suddenly get massive amounts of game money that then overload the game economy, that's where we have to sort of seriously think about it in terms of how it affects the game. I just want to say, David, I do, I, I do overall agree with your kind of holistic approach to game design. It's actually very much how I try to live my life, which is simply to <laughs> avoid being griefed by teenagers. Which, yes. If I, can, if I can do that, I feel like I'm doing okay. In so many ways. <laughs> As much as it pains me to do so, because I really could talk to you two guys about this kind of stuff all day, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up. I want to say, uh, Chris, thanks to you for joining us, and, and seriously, congratulations on this tremendously successful okay. funding effort. But I guess really now it's it's this is just now the beginning of the actual difficult part, which is which is the building the game. When are we when are we actually gonna see this thing? Uh, well, the, the 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 full final game will be approximately two years from now. But um, one of the advantages, and I think the same is true on David's Elite, is if you're if you back it early, you know, besides being part of the community and the discussion uh, and and having your voice heard and seeing sort of what's happening in the background. So, you know, I, we're going to, uh, you know, instead, we don't have a publisher, but you know what? We're going to treat our backers the same way we would a publisher. Yeah. So we get to a milestone, we're going to give them a show and tell and all the stuff. And personally, I'd rather do that to them than a publisher because I'm showing it to 100,000 people that really care about this and get excited by it. And so that's kind of cool. But the other thing that you'll be able to do is play uh, sort of the early builds. And the way I'm the way I'm sort of structuring is I'm trying to uh, test out components of this overall bigger universe uh, along the way. So I don't just drop everything all at once. So in 12 months time, you'll be able to play the single player 
I mean, I'm sorry to say, the multiplayer dogfighting alpha, which won't be the full persistent universe and it won't be the single player game, but it will be basically all the ships that you pledge for. Think of it more like World of Tanks. And we're going to use that to uh, balance the combat, um, you know, fine tune it with uh, the help of the community and uh, try and see, you know, exactly stress test how many people we can get in an instance at any one time. And then, uh, you know, about six to 10 months after that, we'll do a sort of beta of the single player campaign, which is the Squadron 42. And then finally, the full persistent universe beta is just sort of, uh, you know, going to be about 20 months or so after now. And the live release should be about 24 months. Um, but of course, you know, there, it, there may be plus or minus a month, to, you know, not minus, but at least plus a month or so well, in that on, on the bigger thing at the end. But I'm pretty confident about the dogfighting alpha in 12 months. Yeah, well, I'll be one and, of the players David, there, Chris. David, as, as we said, your, <laughs> your Kickstarter is in a slightly different position. It's still very much ongoing. You're, you are kind of at the... It's interesting that you are kind of tracking like right where you should be, I guess. You're about halfway through the, the funding process and you've got about half the funds that you need. Are you are you confident at this point? Are you anxious about hitting your goal? And, and what's your day to day? Are you already kind of built? Are you managing the Kickstarter full time or are you already kind of building the, the game in anticipation of hitting your goal? Well, we've been working on the game for a while now anyway, but um, certainly uh, anxious but confident. Does that make sense? <laughs> I, mean, I think we we'll, are, you, are I, you able to look at kind of where you are and what you've raised and the, the way that donations are coming in and how much time you have to go and kind of extrapolate whether or not you're likely to overshoot the goal or if you might need to do extra work or what? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, one of the things that I absolutely don't want to do is is take things for granted. You know, we're we're, we're obviously extremely appreciative of all the support we've got so far, um, but also I, very. I saw, I saw a Kickstarter just yesterday that came up short by twenty eight dollars. Yeah, I saw that. Terrifying. I mean, yeah. I mean, why, I mean, it makes me wonder why you didn't just get like a buddy to kick in the thirty dollars at that point. Well, because over, uh, the, over the hump. I think because most of the amount at the end came in very, very late. Oh, uh, but it just didn't. Oh, okay. I mean, there was there was another one that was was close, which is I don't know if you know there are there are two Kickstarters and two Indiegogos funding pledges for the Elite Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> For books, yeah, what... I think that's the first actually. I mean, I think <laughs> that's that, right. I think it's kind of cool. There's also some on their Kickstarter funding the uh, the you know, people writing their own fan fiction. That's right, and that's, two two of them really have now cool. got it. So and so that came close. Do you actually have other kind of fundraisers out there online that are funneling into this main one? Is that how it works? Uh, well, it was it was nothing to do with us. It was absolutely fantastic. I mean, they um, unilaterally set it up because they really wanted to write uh, a, a novel based in the game world. And that's what the, the prize for that pledge is, if you like, the, the reward for that pledge. Well, and I, as I recall, uh, the original Elite came with that really cool novella. So I think it would be kind of spiritually correct for you to have the same thing here, right? Well, exactly. That's, that's exactly the plan. I mean, I, I, w I will say that, like, on, on David's side, I'm, I'm pretty confident David's going to make it because typically at the end, uh, you have a big sort of hockey stick. I mean, we actually raised a lot more money at the end than we did at the beginning. Um, right. Because everyone, it's, it's something weird. Everyone either wants to be in at the very beginning or the very end, and they don't particularly. I don't know what it is. But no one wants to ever be in the middle. <laughs> uh, and there's a lot of people that hang out and they want to like just be the last person to fund. It's, I mean, it's a really weird dynamic. Uh, and the the other thing is, uh, and the one thing that that, that that I would say, and I think David understands it too, is that I definitely noticed that. Um, there's an acquisition dynamic that goes on that's not too dissimilar to a free-to-play acquisition dynamic or you know that you would see in in a Facebook game or something where basically you need to drive eyeballs to your uh, Kickstarter side or your play, crowdfunding site and then a certain number of those people will convert and you know even though you think that you're you know you got written up in all these trade magazines that uh, your game's coming out there's actually a huge amount of your audience that never saw that particular article that day so, and the way the news cycle works now is it's so quick that if you blink you'll have missed the news and so i still have people show up to star citizen oh, i didn't even know this was happening i want to you know and you would think well geez i had press everywhere and you didn't see it but there's a lot of people like that so i think the the, the biggest thing uh for uh, David, which he'll, I'm sure, I'll get at the end, is, is if you get coverage, um, because I always could see spikes. Whenever we had articles, I could actually see revenue spikes. Where you know, if, if there was some a piece in IGN or it was written up somewhere, you could literally see the rate of uh, money raising double or triple. And so it's really getting getting exposure is the most important thing. And uh, so you know, any, I mean, as far as I'm concerned on this, I'd love to, you know David to get exposure. And I'm uh, towards. When it gets close to the end of his campaign, where I think it will be the most useful, I'm going to reach out to my community and say, you know, 
go go back silly. If, I mean, if I haven't taken all your money, I'm sorry for doing that. But if I have taken, <laughs> you've still got some more money. Please back elite because I think that would be cool too. There you go, David. Chris will be your hockey stick. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> So, um, oh, that's, and, and li- literally live when we were on the podcast, David, I saw you went from 13,999 backers to 14,000. So somebody became your 14,000th backer. Hey, cool. Congratulations for getting 14,000. <laughs> so if people want to find out more about Elite Dangerous and, uh, and donate to the Kickstarter and become a, a backer, where should they go? Uh, well, um, to the Kickstarter, look on the Kickstarter website, look for the Elite Dangerous campaign and come and join us because it's, it's going to be a fantastic ride. Yeah, I'm looking at the different. I'm looking at the different pledge levels right now, and trying to figure out where I want to come in at. I, I basically want to get whatever pledge level allows me to annoy you the most. Which one would that be? <laughs> Not pledging so, at all, maybe. They sort that one out. Actually, there's a, there's a one where you could go to dinner with them, but that's uh, well. And I see here, so the, it's at your very very top tier pledge five thousand pounds or more, and that was open to five backers. That's completely sold out. So you already got all the kind of the big money donors. That's pretty cool. Yes, that's right, and and. Huge thanks to those people who, who went in for that category. So uh, you could write a book, Gary. <laughs> yeah, I could still do that. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. So you've got two of those spots left open. Uh, all right, let's see. Where, where am I going to come in here? Oh, I have a planet named after me. Maybe that one. And I'll, but I'll change my name to something really obnoxious first. <laughs> you go for that. All right, listen, Chris and David, thanks so much for taking the time. I'm really excited to see both of your games, and um, I hope to see some updates on them both soon. And thank you very much to both of you, by the way. Much appreciated. Thanks a lot. Welcome, and thanks, Gary, for for hosting this. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon, David. Thank you, and thank you, everybody who's pledged as well.